title for the message is The Church's One Foundation. And this hymn, it's actually the title of a hymn that I stole it from, uh, but also the text uh, I would like to think. Uh, Samuel J. Stone wrote this hymn in 1866, and this was in response to heresies that arose from the pen of uh, John Colenso. And John Colenso was a a Church of England bishop, and this heretical bishop denounced Scripture, and once you start denouncing Scripture, then all sorts of things begin to fall. All sorts of doctrinal matters uh, give way to heresy. And uh, this bishop wrote a book um, uh, putting forth his beliefs, his heresies, and Samuel Stone wrote a collection of hymns, and the title of this hymn book, if you will, uh, Liar, L-Y-R-E, so Songs of the Faithful, 12 hymns on the 12 articles of the Apostles' Creed. Well, some of you might not be familiar with the Apostles' Creed, but uh, basically it's the historic Christian faith, the basic historic Christian faith, uh, specifically to whom we are believing in. We believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this was compiled at least uh, as far back as the 3rd or 4th century and possibly even earlier than that. Uh, In fact, I want to read through it quickly with you. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. Now, that's a red flag for some of you. Um, just so you know, when it's talking about Christ's descent, uh, this is based on Luke 16, where in, in Hades you have the, the place of suffering, right, where the rich man went, and then you have the, the place of Abraham's bosom, the blessed place. Well, until Christ's death and resurrection, that is where believers went. Christ said to uh, the thief on the cross next to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. So that's where they went, and once Christ died and rose again, He emptied out Abraham's bosom to go and be with God in heaven. So this is the ancient confession of the church, so don't be startled uh, with that wording there. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. Now, another red flag is probably going up with you. Notice it's a small C, not a capital C. The capital C would be in reference to the Roman Catholic Church. This lower C is in reference to the Christian church of all ages of all times. It's just referring to the universal church, all those who have believed in Christ, trusted in Christ, and are in Christ. The forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and uh, the life everlasting, amen. So, the reason that I highlight all that for you is that each one of the hymns that he wrote in that book were based upon lines, uh, the 12 lines from uh, this uh, creed. The one that we're looking at this morning, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints is what he based this hymn off of, along with many, many passages of scripture. So Samuel wanted to combat the false teachings and heresies through writing solid hymns that communicated the historic ancient creed, uh, but more importantly, that communicated the teaching of Scripture as the people sung it, so that whenever they came across books like that bishop wrote, that they would say, hey, wait a minute, that is not the church's belief. This is what we believe. So, the church's one foundation this morning. Um, As we consider that, I saw this past week the news of a very large Methodist church in northwest Arkansas that split into three uh, churches over two major issues that are attacking the Protestant church today. One, One is welcoming those embracing the LGBT community and lifestyle as not being sin, uh, and two, embracing women as pastors. Uh, I'll just say plainly, um, without hesitation or stuttering, the scripture is clear. Neither of these things are to be amongst those who have Christ as their foundation and his word. The reality is it's not just the Methodist church that is splitting 
over what the Bible says on both these matters. Several other Protestant churches have given complete sway to embrace false teachings and practices and are in direct conflict with God's word. Others may not recognize this, but they are wrestling through this question, and I would word it this way for them. Do we stay with Christ and his word, or do we build another foundation for our authority? They would never word it that way, but that's exactly what they are wrestling through. If a church abandons Christ and his word, they are not the church of Christ, a Christian church. Listen to the verse of Samuel's hymn that begins, the first verse of the church's one foundation. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her and for her life he died. Amen and amen to that. Let's dive in with our first point. In your bulletin, you see three points if you're a note taker. Um, Three points. We're only going to get through two of those points today, and we'll have to reserve the other for next week. The first point is only one foundation, Christ. Only one foundation, Christ. We've already read it, but verse 1 through 4. When Paul had planted the church in Corinth, they were young believers. They needed milk. Uh, They couldn't handle the meat of the word. Think of trying to feed an infant a piece of steak. You know, baby Hattie is going home today in the Farkas home. Now, I'm sure they like steak, like most of us enjoy when we can get a bite of steak. But they will not be feeding that baby a piece of steak, right? It would be problematic because the baby's digestive system is not prepared to handle meat like that. Listen, neither could the Corinthian church, because of lack of maturity, they could not handle the deeper subjects in the school of Christ. They still had some weaning from their sinfulness and their sinful ways, their fleshly ways. Uh, There were many problems amongst the Corinthian believers, but here in our passage, Paul addresses the foundational problem. Christ and his word must be your foundation. The fruits of the problem were issues of jealousy causing fights and quarrels among them and some were desiring bigger following uh, in their tribe uh, over those who had maybe a smaller tribe hey i follow apollos you follow paul and our group's bigger there was jealousy and fights among them because of this and listen these sorts of division are worldly they have no place amongst believers Because we only have one foundation. We only have one place to go to for our faith and practice, and that is Christ and his word. Verse 11 says this plainly, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But there are attempted replacements of Christ as the one foundation all around us. Uh, Roman Catholics, which... You know I'm not shy to highlight. They have Christ's word, Christ's word, plus tradition on equal level. So they say that they have Christ and his word as their foundation, but they have another foundation laid right next to it, and it is the Roman Catholic Church's tradition, as as spoken by popes and other writings. Uh, The problem is, is when you have more than one foundation, man's tradition will eventually usurp the tradition, the beliefs, the teaching of Christ as found in his word, which is exactly what the Roman Catholic Church has done. Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Islam, both undermine the one foundation of the church by replacing Jesus of the Bible with a whole different Jesus, And then by saying that the foundation of God's word was corrupted and they have received new revelation that you need to adhere to rather than the revelation given to us by Jesus Christ. Progressive Christianity rejects both Christ and his word. Uh, Where their and society's morals change so that they uh, and the world become the foundation by which they build 
their church. That is the foundation that they've used to replace Jesus. A different Jesus of the Bible and a different Bible altogether. And the basis for it is what they feel. However their heart leads them. And then society around them. Christ and his word then play second fiddle to the preferences of a progressive Christianity. So basically, they invent their own beliefs about God, they invent their own beliefs about sin and judgment and about salvation. And whenever a passage aligns with their invention, their preferred beliefs, they accept that as scripture, but all the rest is under their preference for editing. Another line from the hymn that should encourage us in light of all these attacks on the one foundation of Christ and his word. Listen to this. The church shall never perish. <laughs> the gates of hell shall not prevail. Right? Her dear Lord to defend, to guide, sustain, and cherish is with her to the end. Though there be those who hate her <laughs> and false sons in her pale against both foe and traitor, she shall prevail. She shall ever prevail. Listen, Jesus is the one foundation. And listen, when I say Jesus is the foundation, I'm saying Christ and his word is the foundation. Biblical Christianity recognizes that God has revealed to us whom he established as the foundation of the church. It's Jesus Christ. And what Jesus has spoken to us through his word, and it is upon this that we stand and stand alone. The word of God, the word of Christ is the sole infallible authority. Even all creeds and confessions have to submit to the word of Christ. And where they don't, they are in error. And where they affirm, they are right. So those of you who may think, I I'm trying to get away with saying Christ has, Christ is the one foundation, but then saying that one foundation is Christ and his word, you may be thinking, well, Chris, you're saying there's two foundations. Realize this, the Bible itself is called the word of Christ. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Listen, we are supposed to be so familiar with Christ as revealed in his word and his word such that this is what our communication ends up being. This is the songs that we write to sing back to God are so filled with God's word that we're singing truth in one another's ears and we're singing truth back to God himself. Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the one foundation of the church. And if that is true, then all that Christ is and all that he has revealed to us in his word is our standard of faith and practice in the church. Because Jesus is God, the Bible is rightly referred to as the word of God and the word of Christ. Uh, not only is Christ and his word the one foundation, but this foundation never changes because Jesus never changes. Look at Hebrews 13, 7 and 8. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus has, is not only timeless, but he has given us a timeless word that needs no amending, needs no altering, needs no apology for, just needs the church, the believer, to stand firmly on the one foundation, Christ and his word, and proclaim it graciously, truthfully, and boldly. Since Christ and his word is our one foundation, there will never be a Christianity 2.0. We don't need to reinvent it. We might need to rediscover it, but do not need to reinvent it. Christ and his word never change. And you and I don't need to worry about it changing. Unless... The only thing that would need to be changed is our understanding of it where we are off kilter, where we have gone astray, 
We must reform our ways back to Christ and his word. And in fact, this is where the saying, Ecclesia Reformata Semper Reformanda, it means the church reformed, always reforming. In other words, the church is to be formed by the word and always being reformed back to the word where and when necessary. We're not talking about reformed theology. I'm talking specifically about where we have strayed from what God's word says, we must turn back to that word because the word of Christ and Christ is our one foundation. Christ and his word is the plumb line by which we test everything, including the songs we sing, including the prayers we pray, including the messages that are preached from behind this pulpit, as well as everything that is taught in every Sunday school class. Not only that, but every single practice that we do as a church is to be examined against that plumb line and no other. Because While the churches may change over the centuries, Christ and his word do not. So we must go back to the word and form ourselves according to it. Not only is Christ the one, Christ and his word, the one foundation, we also see Paul addresses there's only one who deserves glory in the church. Not only in the church, but in the entire world, in the entire universe, and it's God. Continuing on in the hymn, she is from every nation, speaking of the church, yet one over all the earth, her charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth, one holy name she blesses, partakes of one holy food, and to one hope she presses with every grace endued. Verses 5 through 9, we get into some of the bickering back and forth that's happening in the Corinthian church, needlessly here. And Paul reminds them what the focus should be, where the glory ought to be. He highlights that Apollos, uh, he and Apollos are but servants. Jesus is the master. Paul is pointing out the same issue voiced by John the Baptist concerning himself and Jesus. He, Jesus, must increase. I must decrease. And and Paul gives the Corinthian believers five reasons that he and any other mere human should fade into the background and that they would instead, the believers would all together be united in giving glory to God and glory to God alone. First, he and Apollos, it says, is they're but servants of God. This word for servant is the word that's used when you were wealthy enough to hire somebody to serve the table in your home and to serve the guests in your home, the one who is serving the food at the table, the servant, right? The praise and the glory wasn't going to the servants in the home, but rather the master of the home, the owner of the home was the one that was honored. And Paul is pointing out, he and Apollos, they're but the servants at the table. This is the word used for a servant versus master. God is the master. Paul and Apollos are but servants. This is important to remind ourselves that we do not serve ourselves, but God is the master of us, and we serve not at our pleasure, but at his divine pleasure. Second, that he and Apollos are but recipients of the gifts of God. It wasn't as though they brought to the table some extraordinary human heroic gifts and God said, man, I'm glad you came to me. Now I can use all the special gifts you have in my kingdom. No. He says that, that we've received these gifts from God. The Lord is the one who gives the assignment to each of his servants. God gifts individually to bless the whole, so that God is glorified in and through them individually and as a whole. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 12, 11. Speaking of all the members of the body, of the, of the church, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. We can't even take credit for the gifts that we have. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has determined whom he will gift with what gift. And that determines how that individual will serve amongst the body of Christ. So Paul's saying, quit looking at us. 
Focus your eyes on God who has blessed the church with these gifts. Not the ones that were blessed with the gift, but the giver himself. Third, that he and Apollos served with the gift God gave them, but the reason their ministry is as fruitful as it is is because God is also the one who gives the growth. Paul can't take credit for growth in the Corinthian church. Apollos can't take credit for it. There's no one amongst them that could take credit for it except for God. Look at verse 6. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Without the calling to be servants of God, without the gifting of the Holy Spirit given them, without the powerful working of God, the Holy Spirit, in the hearts of those whom they ministered to, it would be utterly fruitless. Paul says, I am but the one who throws out the good seed of the word that God gave me. He provided the the light of understanding. He's the one who tilled up the hardened and rocky soil to make it ready to receive the good seed. God provided the water which further nourished the good seed, planted in the good soil, and God is the one who blesses it all to make it grow. God's the gardener. He's the one who has done all in all and through all, in order that he receives all the glory and praise. In fact, that's the fourth thing. In view of this, God is the one who is to receive all glory amongst the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 7. So neither he who plants, Paul, nor he who waters, Apollos, is anything but only God who gives the growth. They are not anything, but God is everything. Paul tells the Corinthian church that they're not to be considered in any way worthy of glory in regards to this. They're not to be considered anything, but only God alone is is worthy of honor and praise and adoration for any fruit that is produced, including growth. Not only as numbers, we're not talking numbers, but Growth in discipleship. Growth in knowing Christ and going out and pursuing, making other disciples. This is also true for heritage, for the blessings that are here. This is true for your home, the blessings that are there. This is true for the blessings at your school that you see as you minister as a Christian teenager. In your school and you see others coming to you, hey, pray for me. Hey, help me understand this passage of Scripture. Help me understand why you live this way and think this way and you see fruit there. Or at work for your secular labor. God is to receive all the glory and all the praise for anything good that comes out of anything. You might say, well, you know, I've worked hard and I labored and I can see who gave you the body to work hard. Who is making your heart pump within your body so that your limbs can move to do the work that you do? Who gave you the breath? Who caused you to be born? All the praise, all the glory goes to God. Sadly, even some Hollywood stars who do not know God personally through Jesus Christ recognize that there is a God. And when they get their reward, they will stand up and they will even recognize, yeah, God made me. God gave me these abilities. I should give thanks to him. And some of them do know God. Don't get me wrong. But some of them don't, but they still have, because they're made in the image of God, a recognition they should be giving thanks to him. How much more then should the Christian who has enjoyed the benefits of the blood of Christ that's been poured out for you and I, that has brought us into this covenant family, ought to recognize that God deserves all the glory for the fruitfulness. When we know God made us, God saved us, God filled us with the Holy Spirit, God is the one who has gifted us by the Holy Spirit. When then we serve our master God with all that he has given us, and then God gives growth, it makes no sense whatsoever to point at that growth and say, look what I did. 
Look how many churches I planted. Look how many churches uh, I've started. Look at how many pastors I've trained. More than all the seminaries combined. Some of you know what I'm talking about. We don't point to ourselves. We point to God who's done it all. And we just get to be that weak vessel through which God works. And when we recognize the weakness that we are, that have, we know we can't look to ourselves and say, look how glorious I am. But we can't stop for saying, look at how glorious my God is. Romans eleven thirty six, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Fifth. All believers belong to God. We are His. We are united in Him and to Him together. This is verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. This I am of Apollos and against Paul, and you should be too, mentality still divides the body of Christ today unnecessary division amongst the body of Christ. And Paul's point is this is sick because Paul and Apollos uh, and the Corinthian believers all belong to the one and same Savior and same God. And they serve the same Savior and same God. And the Corinthians are the field that they have been sent to serve in. How might this look today? Dividing over uh, genuine Christian theologians or pastors or authors who espouse differing views all within Christian orthodoxy. Like saying, <clears throat> I'm of Calvin, I'm of Wesley, I'm of MacArthur, I'm of Dobson. And looking down on those who are not in the same camp, thinking you're better than them and wanting people to join your club. If you're in Christ, you're already in the same church. Leave the clubs aside. Leave that to Sam's Club and their admission price. But in the church of Christ, Jesus paid the admission price. And by faith, we've all gathered at that throne and have been united as sons and daughters of God by his blood. How dare we separate over foolish arguments? Uh, differences that we can discuss and still be within orthodoxy today. How about translation preferences? How about eschatology? That's end time views. There are different views on eschatology and we're not all on the same exact page. Are there heretical views? Absolutely. We should not embrace heretical views of end times, but we should embrace one another even if we do have a different view on that. How about uh, ecclesiology? That's church government. How exactly it's stru structured church government is structured in each church we might have different views on that there's that's okay how often we do communion oh we do it you know every day of the week we we do it every sunday we do it once a month we do it three times a year four times a year these are areas that we can have differences on and still be within christian orthodoxy and dare i say within the same church why because ultimately, it's not these things that we are united on, but Christ and his one foundation. It's one thing to charge one another with heresy and divide the body of Christ and cause dissension over genuine Christian theologies that are and have been within orthodoxy for thousands of years. But it's another thing to engage in good Christian discussion and even debate within orthodox Christian matters and then joyfully go out for a meal together. Joyfully go out and share the gospel with our neighbors. Joyfully pray for one another. Instead of dividing and there being dissension over non-essential differences, let's do what 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11 says. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. 
as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves is the one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the point of it all. But the enemy wants to come in and cause strife and dissension. And just like the Corinthian church, there's blessing here, heritage. God is working in and through you and your varied gifts, and he's bringing growth. But make no mistake, the devil wants to come in and cause us to fight and quarrel about things that don't matter. At the end of the day, sure, they might be fun to discuss and wrestle through. But at the end of the day, May we be united on Christ and his word and giving God all the glory. And may that be enough. Have you ever went down into a cave and then when you, you came out of that cave, uh, your, your eyes in that cave, were, you were in such depth of darkness that your, your eyes dilated so big to let in any amount of light. But then you come up out of that cave and the sun is shining so bright that you can't see someone in front of you, you can't see trees around, you can't see any buildings because that light is so glorious, if you will, so bright that it takes time for you to see that there's other things around as we serve in church ministry in our home in our place of work in our schools in our sports in the public arena may we do so in such a way that the brightness of the glory of Christ so shines upon those we serve that all they behold is not you and me not Heritage Baptist Church but they behold the glory of Christ they see no one else nothing else other than the exalted Savior in and through a people united in him for him by him and for his glory because only God deserves such praise you and I need this mentality that we are not seeking to exalt ourselves in anyone's mind, but our aim is to bring glory to Jesus as you and I fade into the background. As he increases, may we decrease, not only in others' minds, but also in our own. Let's pray. Lord. Lord.